If I ask this question, I'll get any no's on it. Uh, how many people here tonight know about a broken heart? Yeah, that's what I figured. Most folks do. Uh, I want to remind you that the Apostle Paul, in Romans chapter 13, knew very much about a broken heart. Uh, you could actually argue the point quite good or well that if anybody knows a broken heart, it's also God. Uh, he loved us so much, and we broke his heart in so many ways. But here tonight, I want to tell you about the way to fix that broken heart. It's with love. Now again, we know that's what breaks the heart, but it's also what repairs it. The Apostle Paul says that it's love that brings the dead heart back to life. And really, there's nothing like that. The darkness, the emptiness of brokenness in our heart that feels like death. But all you got to do is trust and believe that God didn't break your heart. That even in your rejection of Him, He didn't give up on you. And He's here this evening, we're here this evening, to celebrate the fact that Jesus Christ came, lived, died for us. So we know exactly what God's love is for us. And He can awaken us at that level, in that spirit. There were chains around us, and by your grace we are no longer bound, no longer bound. You call me out of the grave, you call me into the light, you call my name and then my heart came alive.
for his love and his freedom tonight in this place. We just worship him in this place tonight and thank him for freedom. Thank him for his grace. Thank him for his love. We bless your name tonight, Father.
Jesus, we're here to worship. You and you alone, Lord God. Oh, Lord Jesus. We're going to shout your name until walls crumble. Down below the very foundations on which they've been formed. Father, even as your people circled that city of Jericho, the first time, the second time, the third, fourth, and fifth, and sixth time, Lord God. When was it going to end, Lord God? When were those walls going to come down in their life? When was that victory going to take place? Jesus, we thank you for your victory. That when we shout, oh, and worship at the feet and declare the name and the power of Jesus in our lives, Walls that have stood between you and us, Lord God. Walls that have stood between just any kind of progression forward, Lord God. They come down because you're the doorway through that wall. We see an opening and we go through that opening, Lord God. So I'd encourage you tonight, if you're in this room, don't just settle in your head while well, yeah, we sung one song, we sung another. Now it's time to move on to the next part. But let's just take a moment to raise our hands in this place. Oh, and just start to mutter. Mutter the name of Jesus. Jesus, meditate. That's what that word means, to mutter, just to say it over. Jesus, I thank you for your victory. Jesus, Jesus, I thank you that you made a way where there was no way. Jesus. I've come to worship your name, shout your name until walls of opposition come down in my life. Jesus, I thank you for the breakthrough. Jesus, I thank you that that thing that's been stopping that progression in my life, oh, it's getting behind me and the way before me is clear. You're illuminating my path, Lord God. Come on, speak it out, speak it out, speak it out. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I'm not going to stop too early, Lord God. I'm not going to stop too soon, Lord God. Father, I'm just going to just press in. Press in, press in, press in. Jesus, we shout you. Jesus, we shout you. We shout you. We receive everything you have for us, Lord God. Every victory that you've opened up, every way that you've made, Lord God. Everything that is ours in heaven, we declare it manifest here in this place right now. With every heart open, Lord God, we just thank you for victory, 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 victory to manifest in people's lives. We're going to shout your name, Lord.
Church, why don't you uh, give the person next to you a high five, a hug, give them some love, welcome them here to the mid tonight, ask them if they're expectant for God to deposit something significant, because that's the way we should always come into his presence, amen, amen. glad to be in the house of the Lord tonight. I'm excited about what God's doing all throughout our region and, and what he's doing here within this body. Glad that you're here tonight. There's something about a midweek service, um, we've said it before, that it is just a time that we kind of get through most of the week and then suddenly God just begins to refresh us midweek. Um, yes, I do want to say we do have uh, early childhood for some little ones, so if you have little ones, um, <laughs> you can go ahead and I think Miss Mary Lee has them tonight. Awesome. We're excited. I love seeing the little kids because we were talking about this weekend Sunday uh, at Fresh Expression. Our kids are rampant everywhere. It's awesome. I love being able to walk out on Sunday mornings and they are just running the hall. They're running the hallways. It's awesome. Um, God has absolutely just blessed us with kids, but then I also love the fact that he's blessed us with all ages here. And uh, we can appreciate the heritage that many of our seasoned adults have uh, given to us. I say that seasoned because I know they don't like to ever be called anything else. And, uh, <laughs> but tonight's going to be a great night tonight. I know Pastor Kevin's got a great word that he's going to be bringing this evening. Um, tonight there is no, uh, there's no marriage class, but there is a, the parenting class tonight. And it's going to be upstairs with Todd. There's Todd. But tonight there is no marriage uh, discussion this evening. So we're going to be in the sanctuary together. Before we, though, uh, dismiss to those classes and do those things, we want to receive our regular tithe and offering tonight. So if you've come prepared to give, I want to encourage you. There's a few ways that you can. Underneath of each chair, there are some offering envelopes <clears throat> that you can take and you can make your checks payable to ECH. Or if you give cash, just make sure it gets inside of that envelope so that you can get contribution credit for it. And um, we, um, we, we want to make sure that you're blessed throughout your whole entire year as you're being a blessing to the kingdom of God as well. Also, you can text give. The text giving number is 84321. 84321. All you have to do is punch that in your two. Uh, who the message is to, and then in the message body type, how much you'd like to give, and you'll be able to do that that way, and you can set that up. All right, are we ready to give tonight? Yeah. Can we go ahead and raise our gifts to the Lord? If you don't have to give tonight, but you have a desire to get to that point, I ask that you raise your hand as well. So, Father, we thank you so much for who you are. And God, above anything that you could ever bless us with or, or do in our lives, God, before anything, God, we are thankful for who you are. And God, I just ask tonight that you would just bless this tithe and this offering, Lord, as it goes for the upbuilding of your kingdom, Father, and that it would be used, Lord, to just continue on the gospel, your message, and your goodness throughout the earth. In Jesus' name, and all God's people said, amen and amen. Bless you as you give. There is a work day happening this Saturday, and we're going to be from 9 o'clock to 11 o'clock. So if you have some time to give on Saturday morning from 9 to 11, we're going to be very strict about that time to where you're not going to be here all day long. But if you'd like to give time to help, there is a sign-up sheet out here on the information table. So I encourage you to go ahead and sign up. Uh, there's going to be a, a punch-out list that day. We're just going to be doing some fall cleaning. I don't know about spring cleaning, but I know about fall cleaning. So if you'd like to be a part of that, come see one of us, or you can sign up on the table directly after service this evening. All right, Pastor Kevin. Thanks, you. It looks like um, we'll have two hours on Saturday. If we can get about 30 people, it certainly will be a, 
worth our while. We'll divide up outside, inside, upstairs, downstairs, and um, we've got a list that we've made, then nothing terribly difficult, but just lots of, you know, things of well, construction is construction. And what happens is, you know, you kind of, every empty hole becomes a place to put something. <clears throat> so we got to organize, and then outside we've got to do some work on um, some weeds and just a lot of cleanup. And we're, um, gosh, in the process, a lot of things t- still yet to happen. The dedication, which I think you probably mentioned, I would have stood outside, but um, is next Saturday evening, not this Saturday, but next Saturday, the 21st at 6 o'clock. Um, Jim Delbridge will be with us that evening. Uh, he's, a, he's a good friend of ours. Had been with us for candy. He's a friend with him for years. Travels all over the world with him. And, um, but he's connected to Bonnie and Mahesh. Chav, you're right. He's connected to them. He's become really good friends with us. You know, we uh, have got to the point we talk probably a couple, three times a week, he and I now. And um, so he'll be with us on that Saturday night and be ministering. And then on that Sunday morning, uh, we're going to obviously do some dedication stuff. And I'll be speaking. And then after service, we'll have a fall festival. It'll be food free uh, for everybody and just things for kids all over the place. And um, this is kind of neat, too. We had the, um, this past week, we had a, I don't know how else to say it, but a football field of turf uh, donated to us. Yeah, <laughs> we said, wow. We don't know what to, uh, to do with that, but, and it is the, it's the Fairfield, the old Fairfield stadiums um, turf. And uh, it's been given to us. We just got to go get it one day next week. Probably two days. It might take two days to get it, but it's a lot of stuff. So we're going to, we have no idea how, how it fits, but isn't that a blessing? It's, um, that's, that's a blessing. You know, not every day somebody gives you a, a football field, uh, have turf, you know. So um, we prayed about it for just a, maybe a brief moment and said, okay, we'll take it. And didn't have to pray long. So God's blessing us in so many ways. Um, we've got doors. They're, they're, you can see our, some have come in. Some will be coming in the rest of the week. Um, we still have the, the, the door, the hallway floor to finish. Cafe floor still needs to be finished. Uh, windows are going in up here this week. Um, oh, yes, once those bathroom floors are finished, the bathroom partitions are sitting back here. Just waiting to be installed after the floor is finished. So we have those for both men and women. And there's a lot of just stuff that still you know needs to be done. So be in prayer about because <clears throat> we're going to do it as it comes to be able to pay as we go. Since we're here and functional, we want to be able to we want to add any more pressure than we already have felt and feeling. So um, if the Lord lays when your heart to do something, then by all means do it. And so we can just continue on the path that we're on. Uh, so, but things are good. We had an incredible wedding in here uh, Saturday evening. Two uh, people that we've known, one we've known for a long time, the other one we have you know, come to know in the last few years. Uh, they were both, uh, one was a widow's widower, and their, their uh, spouses had passed away, and they're both in their 70s, and uh, got married here Saturday night. It was just a beautiful, beautiful ceremony. And so we've got other weddings coming with the wedding shower that was going on at the next door. There's just a lot of stuff that's happening. As you leave tonight, <clears throat> you'll see there's eight lights that have been put on poles. AEP was here today and put us some floodlights up out front. So we'll be able to, um, it's one thing hitting the curb and not seeing it. Now you'll be able to see the curb you hit. Okay? So um, it kind of works out okay. And we're, we're going to redesign this is just the, the, the blacktop that we just have is about two inches. So it's a whole other layer that has to go on top of it. So we're going to redesign some of that entrance uh, there uh, probably this spring uh, when we go to do the other coat and make it a, a, a little bit bigger uh, because that's, that's kind of tight right there. So uh, make it a little bit bigger entrance so you'll have out here. Just a lot of stuff going on, guys, I'm telling you. And it's all good. 
um, just met with, with Pastor Ronnie and I were just meeting with John Barnhart and Candy. Candy's our missions director. John started a Facebook page a couple of years ago with, uh, on the, the gospel uh, the, of truth, truth of the gospel of grace. And uh, over 7,000 people now are on that from all over the world. 31 countries are on that. And now they're all trying to become a part of this somehow. And we don't even know what that looks like. So John's probably going to have to go to Africa and Barbie and spend about three years over there, and like Paul did, and set, set up churches. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm kidding. He's going to have to go to Africa, but it won't be for three years. So just a lot of stuff like that's happening. I just want to keep you all informed on what's going on. Last week I kind of uh, cracked into something, and I don't know if I cracked it open or cracked it closed, uh, but somehow it cracked. Um, I, I, the Lord has just kind of taken me through a little bit of a journey uh, myself on, um, you know, I'm a guy that asks questions, and I've always been that way. I, 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 I want to know. And, um, you know, when I read a book, an author of a book, when I read the book, I want to know about the author because once I get in the head of the author, I can probably not have to read every one of these books to know what these books are all going to be about because I know how, I start seeing how the author thinks. And I've been that way with the Bible, you know. What motivated Jesus to write when God wrote this or one of the, 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 the gospels were written by one of the disciples, and what motivated, you know, Luke? What motivated Matthew? And then in my encounters in life, I've noticed um, that there's, there's several different kinds of people out there, but you know, two people that stand out to me more than anything that I've encountered, and I was like this too early on, is some people just say, listen, my life is a mess, or my life's okay, and, and, and I really don't want to understand any more than just the basic life principles. And <clears throat> what I've discovered is people that are just kind of see no value in going what I call deeper or broader when life circumstances take turns that are outside of your control, we, have, we don't have a coping mechanism and we don't really understand some of the big pictures and so we begin very reactionary in life. And um, I, I know one guy comes to my mind, a friend of mine I've known for years and years and years, but if I sit down and try to talk to him about the Bible, about God, you know, he's saved, loves the Lord, but if, if you know, he hasn't picked up his Bible, and he'll tell, he would tell you this, he hasn't picked up his Bible in years and years and years. And because um, he already knows he's saved. And he's happy just knowing he's saved. And, but when life problems happen, when, for example, when his kids kind of had a, a, an issue that Willie got on drugs, actually, and he didn't know how to handle that. And not that anybody knows how to handle that, but it, it's difficult. And he spiraled downhill um, because the box that he had already created, you know, Jesus in, somehow it, life was beyond that box. And he didn't know how to live outside that box or even to go outside the box and discover what life was all about. So I want to encourage you that revelation, and when I say revelation, I'm talking about uh, an unveiling, uh, illumination, enlightenment. When you're enlightened um, by the gospel, it, it pr is progressive. Um, and, and what I mean by progressive revelation, the Bible says, Jesus said, you live by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Proceedeth is a continual word. God always speaks new, current, but he'll never contradict his old. Okay? It, sometimes it looks contradicting, but it's not contradicting. Anytime you see conflict in the Bible that looks contradicting, it means we have to dig a little deeper or go a little higher to see because it, it, it looks like one time he's telling them not to do this, the next thing he's telling them to do this, and you're going, and we know he's not you know, that way, but what, what is the problem? So we just got to keep digging until wisdom brings, enlight the enlightenment comes to wisdom, and then wisdom we are able to understand it. Oh, that, that's, I see it. It makes, makes, makes more sense. Last week we were talking about in Romans chapter 5, and I had a, um, just a handful of people that I was kind of bouncing some stuff off of Monday evening, and 
Um, I got this thought, and I'm going I'm I'm to share this thought with you, and then I'm going to kind of flesh it out here, even though we're on the internet. Um, and then I want to go into Romans chapter 5, like we talked about last week, about developing patience in the Lord. Okay, let's just suppose, hypothetically, as, a, as a, just a parable, that um, I was born in um, the same year that Jesus was born, as a baby, okay? So Jesus and I were born in the same year, went to daycare together, we went to kindergarten, elementary school, grammar school, we grew, kind of grew up together. But I was a Gentile, which means I wasn't a Jew, and he was a Jew, but we knew each other, <coughs> and born in the same year. I knew their message, the message was, one day, the Messiah is coming, and he's going to take away the sins of the world. So one day, he's going to come and take away all the sins of the world. So I knew Jesus heard that message, because that's what Jesus was being preached, because he was a part of the Jewish family. And I had heard it, but I was a Gentile. I wasn't a Jew, so I wasn't entitled to that Abrahamic covenant or that connection to the old covenant. So I was just a sinner lost. But I also knew that one day I heard there was going to be a a Savior come and Messiah and take away the sins of the world. So Jesus and I grow up. And, you know, we graduate. I get to be about 22, 23 years old. And I have a little boy. I get married and have a little boy. And his name is Johnny. And Johnny is born when I'm 23, 24, and Jesus is 23, 24, okay? So Johnny, I'm telling Johnny now, Johnny, one day the Messiah is going to come and take away the sins of the world. He's coming, and he's going to take away all the sins of the world. We got to look for him. He's coming. Now, right now, Johnny, (coughs) we're under this bondage of oppressed religious system, and things are bad. They call us the dogs. We're, we're, we're just not fit for anything. But one day, Johnny, the, the Messiah is going to come and take away all the sins of the, all, all mankind. That's what, the, that's what their scripture says. So I tell Johnny that for the next six, seven, eight years, because Johnny is now seven, eight, nine years old, and I'm teaching Johnny that one day it's going to change. So Johnny gets to be about eight or nine years old, and I have another child. We're going to call him Joey. <laughs> Joe. We're going to call him Joey. So now i got Johnny that's about nine. Johnny's about nine. Joey's just born. And Joey's being raised now. He's three or four. And um, the challenge with him being three or four, it, no, no, I'll take that back. Johnny is eight or nine. Jesus, I, I hit 33 years old, and Jesus dies on a cross, resurrects from the grave. That event takes place. Johnny is born, and he's nine, and I keep telling him one day that's going to take place. I hit 33, 34 years old. I have another child named Joey. Joey is born after Jesus had resurrected. Are you following me? I got Johnny that was born about eight or nine years before Jesus died, and I'm telling him one day he's coming. Then Joey is born after Jesus is resurrected from the grave. My challenge has been the message I preached to Johnny is one day he's coming to take away the sins of mankind, but until then you're under the, the mess. But when Joey comes on the scene... Joey can't hear the same message that Johnny heard because if he hears the same message Johnny heard, it will be that one day Jesus is going to do something, but Jesus has already done it. So Johnny's frame of reference is coming from a historical event that took place, and his life is from that point on, but yet Johnny's, Johnny had to go through the transition from the old to the new. 
from the, from the pre-event to the post-event. So now they're both 20, 25 years old. Or, and they're, they've grown up, they're brothers, and they're comparing notes. Johnny's got a message. Joe, Joey's got a message. We, we all got to be saved. But why is it that I have to convince Joey that he has to go back and identify himself with something that's pre existing? When Jesus took it on the cross, I'm wrestling with that. I'm going to wrestle with it out loud. Okay? So. And I, I've been looking through scripture like crazy. Brendan and I were actually texting back a little bit today. And, and Gary Culver sent some excellent scripture in, first, in Corinthians about <coughs> this, this favorite topic. So let me, let me just tell you where, where, what happened. In Genesis chapter 1, God created in six days, he created all things. He created in the beginning of the heavens, and he created heavens and the earth. And then he created day two, day three, day four, day five. Day, when it came to day six, here's what it says. I want to read this to you. And this is, you're going to say, how does this have anything to do with me? It has everything to do with you. That's, that's the hard part, is to get people to see that there's something you haven't heard or learned or been enlightened to that supersedes all of these issues that we're facing, trying to figure out how to manage. Now listen to this. Here we go. This is on verse 23. It says, And the evening and the morning were the fifth day, day six. And God said, Let the earth bring forth the living creature after his own kind. The cattle, creeping thing, and beast of the earth after his kind, and it was so. <clears throat> and God made the beast of the earth after his kind, and cattle after their kind, and everything that creepeth upon the earth after his kind. And God saw that it was good. And God said on day six, let us make man in our image after our likeness. And let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and the fowl of the air, over the cattle and over all the earth and over every living creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him male and female he them. He created them. God blessed them and God said unto them, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth, and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. And God said, Behold, I have given you every herb bearing seed, which is upon the face of all the earth, and every tree, in the which is the fruit of the tree yielding seed. To you it shall be, be, be for meat, and to every beast of the earth, and to every fowl of the air, and to everything that creepeth upon the earth, wherein there is life, I have given every green herb for meat, and it was so. And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And the evening and the morning were the sixth day. Chapter 2. Thus, the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them. And on the seventh day, God ended his work, which he had made, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work, which he had made. And God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because that in it he had rested from all his work, which God created and made. These are the generations of the heavens and the earth when, when they were created. And in the day that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens, and every plant Every, on the earth, every herb of the field before it grew. For the Lord had God, listen to this, and every plant of the field before it was in the earth, and every herb of the field before it grew, for the Lord God had not caused it to rain upon the earth. And there was not a man to till the ground. 
But there went up a mist from earth and watered the whole face of the ground. And the Lord God, listen, formed man of the dust of the ground, breathed his own breath in his nostrils and the breath of life, and became, the man became a living soul. And the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed. Out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant in the sight, good for food, the tree of life also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. There was a river that went out of the Eden to water the whole garden. And from thence it was parted and it came into four heads, which would be like the four Gospels. The name of the first is Pison, that is, which is compassed with the whole land of Havila, where there is gold, and the gold of that land is good. There's Bedlam and Onyx Stone, and the name of the second river was Gion, and it goes on to say more description of that. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, of every tree of the garden you can eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day that thou eat it, thereof thou shalt surely die. And the Lord God said, it is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helpmate for him. And out of the ground, the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every fowl of the air. And he brought them to Adam, now he calls him, to see what he would call them. And whatsoever Adam called every living creature, that's what he made. In day six, God created all of mankind. Do you all agree with that? what it says. He created all of mankind. He was created when he was creating all the heavens and the earth. After day six, when God rested, God looked on the entire planet and said, oh my, I don't have any man to till this ground. Even though he had already created man, that man wasn't on the earth. So God takes the earth, forms man, breathes into him, and he becomes a living soul. So you have heaven that he created on day six. Man was still in the spiritual realm. He takes the earthly realm, ground, flesh, puts the two together, and when he breathes on him, he becomes a living soul. So to become a soul, living soul, you have to have spiritual, a spirit, and you got to be, have a body, fleshly body. Now watch this. <clears throat> so, when God goes to Jeremiah, and somebody help me quote this scripture because I always paraphrase this in another version. He says, I knew you before you were formed in your mother's womb. And then he goes on to even say this, I, I know the plans that I have for you. I think he says that even before that. Right, 2911. So he goes on, he says, I got these, these wonderful plans. Just track with me here. I promise you this is going to be enlightening, okay? So my question has always been is, and I got scripture to to back this up, and I'll give you another scripture that's going to confirm this, is that all all people, all human race, all, all mankind, Nadia, for example, before you were ever formed in your mother's womb, God knew you. So if he knew Nadia before she was even in her time on the earth, she had to be in God. Agree? In God. Because everything came from him. So you were in God, and then in an appointed time on her birthday, the year and month and date of birth, she comes into the earth right? She comes into the earth, and she, in God, in heaven, but now she's in the earth with her date of birth, in time. In God, she was not in time and wasn't even aware. But when she gets here, because she's at earth, she has a living, she becomes a living soul, which means You have to have a body, and you have to have a spirit, and the breath of God to make you a living soul. Are you tracking with me? So before you had a body, you were still in existence in God. 
How do I know that? Ephesians 4, or Ephesians 1 tells me. Watch this. This is not a riddle. I, I promise you, if you'll get this, or you'll, hear, you'll track with me, this is going to open something up for you that Paul wrote in Ephesians. An apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, to the saints which are at Ephesus, and to the faithful in, Jesus, in Christ Jesus. Grace be to you, and peace from God our Father, and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath, look at this, who hath, past tense, blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. According as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world. That we should be holy and without blame before him in love. So you have, you have two events that the Bible talks about. It's one event, but it has two frame of references. 2,000 years ago, Jesus in time had a body, physically died on a cross, was buried in a grave, and resurrected three days later. But interchangeably, that event also is referred to throughout the scripture as the lamb that was slain before the foundation of the world. Are you following me? So when you see Jesus died on the cross in time, it was a, a moment in time in the event in time, but before the foundation of the world ever existed and time ever was a, a place, the lamb was crucified and slain that took away the sins of the world. So if, if you identify yourself in God, which is eternal, the lamb slain before the foundation of the world has an impact on your life. But if Jesus, 2,000 years ago, and I shouldn't say but, but when Jesus died 2,000 years ago, that historical event that took place, it's documented, it's truth, it's uncompromising and non-negotiable. He took away the sins of the world. When Jesus died on the cross, was fulfilling in time what had already taken place from the eternal existence. So... Nadia was in God before Nadia came to the earth because Jesus was in God before he came to the earth. Everybody all right? Are you tracking with me? Jesus was in God, and, and, and then when the fullness of time came, Jesus was born of a woman. Nadia was in God before time, but in the fullness of time, Nadia was born of a woman, right? The lamb that was slain before the foundation of the world entitles her to live an existence before Adam ever sinned. On the sixth day of creation, man was formed. I'm gonna use Nadia again, I like your name. Nadia was born, was created on the sixth day of mankind, of God's creation. God rested on the seventh day, which means he only, not only created her, he created all of you and he created me. And we're all in God. But in the fullness of time, and our appointed time to come here, in the earth, was the date of your birth. Right? You're born into the earth to walk this life out, right? And because we're born in this earth trying to aimlessly try to figure this thing out, Jesus redeemed our fallen state in time. But it was the lamb that took away the sins of mankind in eternity. So here's what happens to a person. 
if, 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 if Nadia was, was born before Jesus came, she was in God, born in time through a woman in a womb, but she didn't have a Savior because Jesus hadn't come yet. So she was lost in her trespasses and her sins. Would we agree with that? In God. Still in God. Not saved, because there couldn't be saved until Jesus come. Lost. She's lost. Why? Because there wasn't a Savior. The Lamb was slain before the foundation of the world, which allows her to still identify pre-existing in Adam. What I'm getting you to see is this. All mankind was born on the sixth day, was created on the sixth day. Adam was formed after Jesus rested. So the sin and fall of mankind happened after Jesus rested. But because you were born, in, you were in God before Jesus rested, you have an eternal state that you can return to after this life is over. Is this complicated? On, okay, okay. On day six, God created man, all man, all women. He created them all, all mankind. He created both he and she in man. That man did not have a name. He just called him man. He created man, both he, female and male. He created man on the sixth day. The very next day, and then God said it was good. Then it says, all of the generations of heaven and earth were created. And he looked at it and went, this is very good. On day seven, the Sabbath, he rested from all of his creation. He looks at all of his creation and says, God, I got the earth here, but I don't have a man to till the ground. Wait a minute, God. What do you mean you don't have a man to till the ground? You just created man on the sixth day. So God, on the day after he rested, didn't create man. He formed him out of what was already created. So when God formed man, he gave man a name, Adam, and man's name, Adam, came in time, but Adam was already created on day six. But his appointed time on the earth was when God formed him. So Adam goes on to sin. When Adam sinned, everybody that's born from that day forward is born in the Adamic, fallen nature. Everybody. <clears throat> right? Everybody. I don't care who you are. Here's the challenge. Nadia wasn't born before Jesus came. So what do you do with that? 4,000 years went by when man was created, formed, and fallen. Jesus comes after 4,000 years and takes the fallen state of mankind and puts it upon himself. So all of the consequences and sin that was Adam's fault for 4,000 years was placed upon him. Right? So a, a person that was born before Jesus didn't have the luxury of being told, hey, man, you're in, you're in God. You, you don't have to ever, the sin can't have its dominion over your life. It can't have it. So you're stuck with terminal consequences of an, another man's sin. Death is your answer, man. The wages of sin is death. And you're going to get it. You have no hope. So the only message they had for 4,000 years was one day there's got to be somebody. A Messiah is going to come 
and put an end to the scare and the fear of, I don't have any hope. So when Jesus comes 2,000 years ago as the last Adam, the first Adam sinned, and for 4,000 years, the consequences of that sin was upon man, and man didn't have hope. But Jesus comes, dies, puts the whole consequence on him, and, 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 and fulfills the Lamb of God, which takes away the sins of the world, that was slain before the foundations of the world. And Ephesians 1 says, you were in him, you, me, we were in him before the foundations of the world. So because we're in God before the foundations of the world, and for 4,000 years, we had no way identifying with that, we come into the earth, and for 4,000 years, people are dying. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, oh, I got, we're pointing to a day Jesus is coming. But something happened when Jesus died. Jesus took the consequences of mankind's sin upon himself. When he did that, listen to me, the outlook of life changed. What, what changed? You no longer have to live identifying with Adam. You can identify with Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4 that says, you were in him. First Corinthians says, you were born in the earth and we had our earthly nature. How much more now? I think it says, doesn't it, Gary, something like that? We'll have our take on our heavenly nature. So, 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 so what am I saying? Is the message of the gospel that you're a sinner, you're a wreck, you need to repent, and you need to get, get, just identify that you're a wicked person, or is the real message that you're really denouncing that temporary time identity and taking on an identity that preexisted Adam? So I can look at Nadia and I say, man, Nadia, you've never heard about Jesus before? Well, listen, I don't know that you know this, but you were in God way before you ever came to this earth. You were in God. And you have in God our, 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 our eternal life. Eternal life. Man, you got joy. There's peace. There's an, an unbelievable prosperity. There's just a, a, an unlimited amount of resources of, 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 of laughter and, 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 and hope. All of that in him. Yeah, you can't have. But somebody told you you were so bad, even though you were already doing the bad things. And the reason you were doing the bad things is because you came from an ancestor that did bad things. So what we try to do is we say, man, you got that, you're, you're, you're in a bad situation. You got to repent. In other words, you got to. That's got to go away. And here's how you do it. You make Jesus your personal Lord and Savior. So then what we do is he, she trades the fear and the bad lifestyle that she once lived to now she believes he died for her sins. So she's going to attempt to live the life that's worthy of him and she's going to try to do really, really, really good. Why? She believed the gospel. You're a sinner. You need to get saved. He'll wash you white as snow. He'll, can I tell you what really is washing you white as snow? He's taking you back to your original state, but he's going to leave you here to live. He's going to let you fly high, and you're going to be a spirit first, 
not just a deformed, because when man formed, he formed Adam out of the ground. When Adam sinned, Adam became deformed. That's why when Jesus was on the cross, he became deformed, beat to pieces. Visage was marred. Why? Because he was taking on the consequences of Adam. So what Jesus really did on the cross was he allowed us to go back to our original state in God on the sixth day that God looked at and said, this is very good. So when God looks at Jeremiah and he says, man, I knew you. If you knew the plans I had for you, I I know the plans I have for you, they're good, with a good end. And then he says this, he goes, I knew you before you were in your mother's womb. What's he saying? Before you were ever in this earth, you were in me. I knew you. I knew you. You were made spotless, without a blemish. You were created in God before Adam. Ephesians 1 4 just says that. Then why is it saved and unsaved? Are we spending all of our time trying to run away and escape? a nature that isn't even you anyway. Yeah, you had it. It, We'd be a mess if we were born in the first 4,000 years because all you had was mercy. God, hope he gives us mercy. But you were born when Jesus died. So not only were you born on the sixth day in God that gives you an eternal perspective of life, that flies a high above everything. You also were born after he resurrected. So not only did God redeem all of heaven, he also redeemed all of earth. So he said, all power is given to me in heaven and earth and under the earth. So Jesus is the king. He is the Lord. He took away the sins of mankind. Here's the problem. The problem is, Before a person gets saved and born again, they're asleep and slumbering from their original identity, who he made them before Adam. Before Nadia became Nadia to us, Nadia existed in God. When you accept Christ, and I mean, the Bible says when you trust in him, when you trust in him that he is that savior, you take on a heavenly nature and you are awakened and enlightened that you are not a temporary person trying to live this life the best that you can. Because when God, when Adam sinned, he hid God came to him and said to him, man, Adam, who told you you were naked? I didn't make you naked. I didn't make you a sinner. I didn't make you a transgressor. When I I created you on day six, you were perfect and made in my image. Think about that. Made in his image. You get down here in the earth, you take on a different identity, and you follow after a different voice, and now you've transgressed. You've given birth to death. You let death enter into the world. Death was under your feet before. You were over it, as long as you're on day six. But now that you give death life, you're subject to it. But who told you you were naked, Adam? Who told you you were a mess? So fast forward 2,000 years after Jesus. Our gospel and our evangelism 
looks like this. You're a sinner. You, you need to get saved. <clears throat> you're, you're unrighteous, and your righteousness is nothing but filthy rags. And you keep creating problems for yourself. So what we do is we raise up an emotional state of being in people that are just trying to escape the consequences and the pain and the hurt and the fears and, oh, God, just get it off of me. I'll come to you, Jesus, if you're a hope. And they come to him as a hope. And then all of a sudden, six months down the road, a year down the road, three years down the road, we still got problems. And we're going, this ain't all what it's cut out to be. I can't live this life. And I'll tell you why you can't live this life, because somebody told you you were naked. Somebody told you, you somebody you were not. Born into the earth, you're born in to flesh. And flesh was given birth to death when Adam sinned. But Jesus gave death to death. 2,000 years ago. So what if you bring in three guys and they're sitting here on the front row <coughs> and you're saying, man, and their life's a wreck. I don't need to point out their sin. They already know they're sinning. I'm not going to avoid it. Bottom line is, sin entered into the world when Adam sinned. But before Adam was, you were in God. What? Yeah. I need you to wake up and know that there was a historical event that took place between Adam and Jesus that you never had to live by. You didn't have to experience that. Because you can know you were born into flesh and know you were redeemed from the curse of the flesh and the law all in the same moment. That's what I'm trying to tell you. If you believe and trust that Jesus died on a cross 2,000 years ago, and that was a historical event that forever changed history, the present, and the future. The power of God himself enlightens you to a whole new world. And the new world is nothing more than who you were before you got here. And if you identify more with the sinful nature of a person than you do before, and you're in right standing with God, I don't care how good you are and how hard you try, you will trip up and trip up and trip up. Am I making sense? So, so what do you tell a, a dead man? He's dead in his trespassing sins. Lazarus, come forth. Live. What? If God looks at you after Jesus died and resurrected from the grave, if God looks at you and still sees a sinner, then he can't see Jesus. So even people that are in sin are doing things that are contrary to their heavenly nature that they don't even know they have. So our job is to tell people, denounce 
that earthly nature and put on your heavenly nature. Well, how do I do that? Believe what he said about you. I looked at them. I still look at them. And I look at Naughty and I go, man, God said, that's just not good. That's very good. First five days were good. It's when he made man in his image. So how do I look at somebody that's in a mess and my self-righteousness looks at them and go, well, man, I'm already saved and, man, they're just, they're, 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 they're robbing people. They're, they're out there whoremongering and they're stealing, cheating. They lie, you can't trust. They look at, how can I look at them self-righteousness and tell them, how can I look at them and say, God, how can I, if I see them in that condition that I'm not seeing Jesus. I'm just wrestling. We're trying to get people to live an eternal life. But if they identify more with the terminal life that Adam had, Adam had a term life. He went from 4,000 years, and Jesus, when Jesus died, Adam died. And when we identify more with that, we're trying to scrape through life just to get ahead, and we don't know how to cope with it. But the minute you begin to see you're in him, and you're in him before all that, and you're in him after all that, Then you can rest in him and say, man, I know. I don't like what I see right now. And man, things aren't going well, and I don't always make the right decision. But I will know this. It's got to turn out in my favor. Because all these things have to work together for my good. If I give you a list of things to do, what Christians are supposed to do, you'll not do one of them, I'm sure. Maybe two. You'll fall. And then if you're doing it and, you're, and your whole relationship with God is based on those acts of instructions, the first time you fall short, you'll get condemned. Your heart will be condemned. Because you're going to always wonder, man, did, is that bad result because of something I did wrong? So God must be out to get me. So you begin to question God's motivation. And then you put all the effort back on yourself to go, man, I gotta, this is, there's a lot of responsibility here. I don't know if I want to do this. I don't know. I can't measure up. But what if we told people this? What if, we, what if we said, Nadia, man, honey, you know all that stuff that you did, that you kept record of, all of it, and you st it still haunts you, and you're going, oh, God. And when you think about it, you just cringe. It makes you sick of your stomach, because you're going, oh, God, I remember when I was so foolish and did that. Man, if I'd already had to live that life over again, if I just could replay that day, if I had to just went there, if I had to just... That first time, that one time, God, if I just hadn't done that, and you replay all that stuff, here's the deal. <clears throat> in God, in God, he don't remember those things. He doesn't remember them because he's not looking at you. He's looking through Christ to see you. And Christ is the mediator, the man, Christ Jesus, that allows you and me to have that relationship, God and you. So you can come boldly to God and him say, 
yeah, I'm, 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 I got to repent of all these things. I, I got God, I, I repent of that. And you remember that one thing, God's going, man, listen, I just see your heart. And all I'm looking for you to do is embrace what I've created you to be. The world has told you you're naked. I never said that. I closed you with a fig leaf. No, I closed you with animal skin. You closed yourself with fig leaf because you knew you were naked. And somebody lied to you and told you you were naked. You didn't have clothes on before you messed up. And because you messed up, somebody told you you were messed up. So now you've taken on this identity as I messed up. No, you're not messed up. You, bu you bought into a lie that you're messed up. No, you're not messed up. So you look at a sinner, somebody that's in a mess, just slumbered over, and they're just, they're, 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 they're the epitome of what the church would look like. We've got to get them saved. You pick them up by their shirt, and you say, stand up. Look up. Man, I'm, I'm not worthy. You don't understand how my life is a wreck. Listen to me. Who told you you were naked? Who told you you weren't worthy? Who told you you were dirty? Who told you you were a mess? Who t you knew that already. But I'm going to tell you who you really are. There was a lamb that was for the foundation of the world that was slain that gives you the ability to take an identity before all your mess. There was a man that died on a cross that took away the sins of all the world that gives you the ability to live after your mess. So you get to live before your mess, blameless, and you get to live after your mess, blameless. Why? Because one is the lamb and one is the Christ, the son of the living God. And you get to live and you're going, what? How could I? Yes. I clothed you with righteousness. You didn't deserve it but I did it anyway. I came looking for you when you didn't even know how to find me. Now get up. Lift up your head. You're not naked. You're not dirty. In fact, you're the son that left, squandered all he had, because you had it before you left. And now you're coming back to the house, and the father just grabs you around the neck and says, give me the ring. Why the ring? A signet ring. Why a signet ring? Because you're going to take my signature. You're going to sign some things, and you'll be a sign as a signatory. Put a robe around him. Why a robe around him? Because he's the robe of righteousness. He's going to clothe him. Then he says, go kill the fatted calf. We're going to have a party and celebrate. Why? Because my son that was lost has now come home. There's too many people living out there. And somebody told them they were naked. They were dirty. They were lousy. They weren't worth it. And they bought into all that lie. Then they come into the church. And we just reaffirm how bad they are so we can get them to accept Jesus as their personal Lord and Savior. And then once they accept Jesus as their personal Lord and Savior, they attempt to live the life that they think is expected of them. And then they fall short, and then we're there to go, oh, you're still naked. Your slip showing. Oh, too much. You, you're, you're, oh, you can't do that. Don't hang around with those people. You're, 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 you're naked. No. Our message is not that you're naked. Our message is that you're clothed. Jesus says, I came not to call the righteous, 
but I've become to call the sinners to repent. That's what he said. Sinners to repent. To what? To go from naked to clothed. To go from a temporary state of consequences of life of trying to live uphill to believe in that he knew you before you were even formed in your mother's womb. And I know the plans that I have for you and they're good. God's heart for mankind was displayed through Jesus. And for some reason, many of us just don't think that was good enough. Because we'll accept Jesus as our Lord. And our tears are running down our face. And we'll walk away going, man, I feel a load lifted off of me. But if you don't take the identity and the, and the, and the view of life that you're no longer a sinner and you're no longer naked and ashamed. You can be saved on your way to heaven and still live a life of hell. Now this thing is burning in me, and I'm working this out as I go because scriptures are coming to my mind, and I'm managing the tension in my head. And I can just feel it. Eternity and time are fighting for one another. They're just fighting. They're just pulling. Yeah. Man, I love you guys. I do. And I want to see you, all of us, live life to the fullest potential. Live life to the fullest experience. But my greatest goal in this season of my life is to accurately represent how God is. Behind the myths, behind the lies, behind the sarcasm and the cynicism, I want, to, I want to accurately represent him. So when you do stand before him one day and I say, Nadia, listen, and you were here for a short period of time, like a life's like a vapor here, but Nadia, he, he loves you. You were in him before there ever was sin. And he made a provision for you before there was ever a sin. So you didn't have to escape a lifestyle of sin, he made a provision that he paid the price for that lifestyle of sin because you couldn't pay that debt. And when he thought of you on day six, you were in his mind. He had your, your whole life willed out and thoughts towards you and God, I'd just love to her to be there in, in 2017 in Huntington, West Virginia, working that job. I got it, I got it all. And, 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 and it's gonna be great joy for her. And I've, I've got all these wonderful things and these, these, these plans. I just see it all good. I see it good. Oh, she's gonna experience some hardships because she's down in the midst of all the chaos. However, she's not naked. She's clothed in righteousness. Oh, and I'm pleased with her. And then when you go stand before him when this life is over, you're not shocked and surprised that he embraces you with such love and compassion. And down here on the earth, we sheepishly, with timidity, wonder, is he ever gonna bring me out of my mess? I want to tell you how he really thinks. So when you get there, you'll go, that's confirmation of what I already know about him. I don't feel the drive to make sure you know you were born in Adam. I just don't feel the drive. I'm not saying it's right or wrong, but oh, I've got to drive. And I've got a burden 
to tell you, you're in him. You were in him from the beginning. You're in him now, and you'll be in him, you'll be in, him in the end. How do I know that? Because he is the beginning, and he is the end. He's the alpha, and he's the omega. He's the beginning and the end. He's the first, and he's the last. He's all of that. So, man, especially you, with you guys in the middle of where your situation is right now in your life, don't let anybody label you naked. Don't let anybody label you, oh, I'm just a, I'm just a sinner saved by grace. You were a sinner, but now you're saved by grace. And if you could ever identify yourself before the sin, Adam's sin, you'd recognize what Christ did for you after his death and resurrection. We need to wake up a sleeping giant. There are more people in the earth that need to be wakened up, awakened. And I'm not talking about with an emotional frenzy, but the reality. God, I'm in him and he's in me. So when Johnny and Jimmy are here, or Joey, whatever his name was, the second kid I had, I look at Johnny and I say, man, Johnny, you're going to be born. You're born and one day Jesus is coming and he's going to take away the sins of the world. And I come over here and after it already happened, I got to look at Joey and I got to say, man, Joey, Johnny was born before the event happened. You're born after. So you don't need to go back and identify with something just so you can cross over of a place you already are. I want you to be aware of it, but I don't want you to have to relive it. Know your history, but don't relive your history. The Lord spoke to me this morning, I gotta close. The Lord spoke to me this morning, told me this, there's gonna be a, an outpouring of the, bab we got that letter in the mail, a bla baptism, an outpouring of the baptism of the Holy Spirit like we have never, ever witnessed. But the baptism of the Holy Spirit will come and fall or come out after the gospel is preached. And the, the hardest part we're having is seeing people in America it's, like, you know, it's over across seas. It's, it's people getting filled with the baptism of the Holy Spirit. But here's the problem. In America, it's not happening like we want it to happen. It's happening, but it's not like what we want to. It's because we've distorted the gospel. Stand with me. I'm going to close. I can't do this anymore. i got next week to get the rest of this. <laughs> if, you'll, if you guys will hang with me and let me work this out over the next three or four weeks I'm just not I'm not kidding you it's going to change some things Father in Jesus name Lord the, the words that spoke out of my mouth tonight that were my, my words and not yours I pray that they fall to the ground but the words that I spoke tonight, God, that were your words, I pray that they fall and be sown in solid ground. And that it will produce the 30, the 60, and 100 fold return in their life. Help us, Lord. God, help us. To narrow down the reality of the gospel, that it becomes a portable transition 
from somebody that's lost that's to somebody that's found. From somebody that's blind to somebody that can see. And let their hearts burn within them of the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ, the only true and living God. Father, we thank you and we bless you in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you all.